she considers herself a revert to the faith, although she never left uh, the church. Uh, for some time, she was drawn to more Protestant uh, ways of believing and worshiping. What happened next, you're about to hear. Uh, please welcome, uh, and Angelica and her family now live in Fatima, Portugal. Please welcome Angelica. Thank you very much, Kevin. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like firstly to begin, before we begin the talk, to open with a prayer to Our Lady, um, the Queen of Heaven and our Mother, who has always, always been with all of us from the beginning of our existence, in gratitude for her constant intercession. So let us begin with the Memorare. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Remember, most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly to thee, O Mother of Mercy, O Virgin of Virgins, my Mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. To me, the least of God's servants is given this grace, to speak to you this day of the unsearchable riches of Christ. Ephesians 3.8 I adopt these words of the great Saint Paul as my own, for I do not consider myself the most qualified spokesperson for the Catholic faith, being neither a paragon of virtue nor an erudite theologian. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace in me hath not been void. 1 Corinthians 15.10 It has pleased God to give me the opportunity to share with you all today one of the billions of testimonies of his love from all eternity. The story of a little lamb, whom he has showered with graces and mercy from the moment of her existence, and whom he continuously pursues with the tenderest and most attentive solicitude, despite her impish, capricious, and sometimes even rebellious tendencies. This little lamb is me. My hope is that in sharing my story, each of you will be moved to likewise reflect on God's relentless yet gentle pursuit of your own souls, and that in doing so, you may perceive the abyss of love in our Lord's adorable heart for you, whom he created and for whom he shed his most precious blood. I also hope that this talk may serve to encourage you to persevere in the Catholic faith in a world which is often hostile to it, but which is in such desperate need for the joy, truth, peace, and beauty, which only the faithful followers of the Good Shepherd can know. This is the story of one of the littlest lambs in the flock of God. She was brought into the world in the cold modern nation known as Canada. A harsh land which throughout its history has been a vast battlefield in the struggle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. Centuries before the birth of this little lamb, it was dominated by hirelings these hirelings claimed to know something of the supernatural, but allowed the little lambs of their flocks to be ravaged and even mauled to death by infernal wolves, for they did not realize that they worshipped them instead of the true God. One day, some of the flocks were visited by shepherds from across the sea, and these shepherds told them of a land of green pasture where they would be happy forever and never be hurt by the wolves again. The shepherds were received with joy by some, but rejected by others. The hirelings of the flock began to grow jealous of them and spread lies to turn sheep against the shepherds. Soon there was infighting in the flocks. Some of the sheep began to follow the shepherds, and others chose to remain under the hirelings. Notwithstanding, the shepherds worked tirelessly to restore all the little lambs from their blindness and to bring them to the light of faith. Even still, the flocks of the hirelings resisted and sought to bring about the ruin of the flocks of the shepherds. 
Eventually, many of these holy shepherds, including Saint Jean de Brebeuf, among others, and many sheep of their flocks were martyred and their communities ransacked. But as the early Christian theologian Tertullian once said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Despite the carnage and near destruction of the flocks of the shepherds, more shepherds and sheep came from across the sea to this wild land and began building new communities, hospitals, and schools, and helped to bring the good news to the segregated flocks so that they would all become one flock and follow the sovereign shepherd. Sadly, other hirelings from across the sea, disguised as shepherds, had also come to this land and with a mighty force attempted to undermine the work of the true shepherds, to decimate their settlements and to govern the whole land. Only one part of the land remained for the shepherds and their flocks. Two centuries later, a nation was formed a union of the flocks of the shepherds and of the hirelings. They were able to materially coexist because the leaders of the nation from whence the true shepherds had come renegated the faith of their fathers in pursuit of greater earthly power and because of their desire to do as they pleased and not the will of the sovereign shepherd. Since then, the true shepherds and their flock have been under the heavy yoke of the hirelings and have had to adapt to an earthly hierarchy opposed to the principles and teachings of the sovereign shepherd. This land over time became increasingly materialistic and less concerned about the message which the first shepherds had brought. The hirelings proposed ideas that seemed more comfortable and pleasant for the present moment and a great number of the sheep, even of the shepherd's flock, came to forget the promise of the eternal, peaceful, and happy green pasture. Today, the flock of the sovereign shepherd lives among the flocks of the hirelings and is constantly tempted by the ideal of the hirelings. Sometimes the pasture of the hirelings appears greener and more enticing than the distant eternal pasture of the sovereign shepherd. The little lambs of the one true flock are influenced by powerful images and ideas presented by the hirelings, especially through new forms of media which grew rapidly and which became methods to control the minds and even wills of the unsuspecting sheep. Still, a small number of the sheep kept the faith which their fathers and shepherds had passed down to them. The battle between the armies of the sovereign shepherd and of the hirelings has only continued to grow fiercer with time. At this precise point in history, when society was taken by storm by ever-changing technological advancements, the little lamb of our story was brought into the world. In the busiest, most populated city in the nation, this little lamb was born on a sunny May afternoon. Her birth was long desired by her parents after many years of waiting patiently for the blessing of the Sovereign Shepherd. The little lamb was raised with lots of love and had many happy memories with her parents. Now her parents had not lived long in this new land, for they had come from another land across the sea with their parents. They were of the flock of the Sovereign Shepherd, but as the whole world had become increasingly enamored with the false and temporary happiness promised by the hirelings, they were also confused. They had some recollection of promises and teachings of the Sovereign Shepherd, and yet they had not been taught everything. Especially because in the decade in which they were born, there had been a great tumult in the structure of the flock of the Sovereign Shepherd. Many hirelings had entered into its ranks, appearing to be shepherds, as well as many wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. And the sheep of the flock became confused and began to believe in the maxims of the hirelings. However, this little lamb's father had come from a very special place in a nation across the sea. A place where the queen of the sovereign shepherd's flock had visited from the eternal green pasture to warn the whole world of these terrible calamities that came to follow. She revealed many mysteries to the sheep and showed them the way to God in the midst of this confusion and evil. The queen of the flock is the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the place was a little village called Kava the Iria, better known today as Fatima, in the small but strong nation of Portugal. 
Before returning to the eternal green pasture, the queen of the flock performed a spectacular miracle that tens of thousands of sheep witnessed. One of these was the great, great grandfather of the little lamb. From that moment onwards, her great, great grandfather's life changed completely. Whereas he had already been an obedient sheep of the flock before, he remained obedient and even more so as his faith also grew and his desire to know the sovereign shepherd and to arrive at the eternal green pasture deepened day by day. He imparted to one of his daughters this lively faith. And although she herself never had a family of her own, she passed down the faith to her nephews, nieces, great nephews, and great nieces. The great great grandfather of the little lamb of this story and his daughter were mocked and despised by the majority of their family. But one little great nephew listened attentively to the wisdom of the daughter of his great grandfather who had witnessed the miracle of the sun. This was the father of the little lamb. He was brought across the sea as a baby when he was just over one year old. He was also raised in the confusion of the world, seeing the sheep of the true flock living according to the precepts of the hireling's flocks. But he also remembered with curiosity and a deep sense of longing for the truths which had been taught him by his great aunt. However, when he grew up, Although maintaining and trying to live these teachings, he also forgot many things and became somewhat confused. The mother of the little lamb of our story also had a very interesting upbringing. She was born in a continent even further from the nation of Canada. It was a beautiful paradise filled with all sorts of natural treasures and exotic animals. Some sheep from the Portuguese nation had gone there and developed the land brought the faith and grew the economy, making this land one of the greatest exporters of crude oil, fish, coffee, and diamonds. It was a flourishing nation until the hirelings of the nation from whence these sheep came made a deal with the hirelings who lived in that land. This land is called Angola. At the age of six, the little lamb's mother had to flee with her family back to Portugal where their ancestors were from but it was no easy task. Angola was already in the midst of a civil war and the little lamb's mother had witnessed many of its horrors. She learned from a very young age of the evils of this world and to cope with the trauma grew to be very tough, hardworking and straightforward, able to recognize when things are not right. Another grace had been given her. Her godmother had given her a relic of Saint Therese of Lisieux a great sheep of the flock of Christ, after whom she was named. She brought this relic with her from the war-torn country in Africa back to Portugal and eventually to Canada, where she met the little lamb's father. She always felt that Saint Therese was with her, protecting her and guiding her. And she still has this relic today, her only possession left from Angola. It was the will of God, the sovereign shepherd, that these two sheep, from different areas of Portugal should meet and marry, <laughs> in all places, Canada. Both confused about the true faith, but believing in the sovereign shepherd, they instilled in their only little lamb a great love for him and a great zeal for truth. From her earliest years, the littlest lamb and her parents had deep conversations about existence, our purpose, morality, politics, history, and all sorts of philosophical and cultural matters. She was encouraged to always ask questions and use right reason, and not to simply accept everything that she was told, for she had been warned about hirelings. So when the little lamb was sent to school, she began to see and hear things that were contrary to what her parents had taught her, both from her teachers and from fellow lambs. Her teachers tried to convince her that she would be able to reach the eternal green pasture by simply being nice to everybody and accepting everything, even if it were contrary to the will of the sovereign shepherd. And her fellow lambs were misguided by their parents, who living according to the maxims of the hirelings, sought only material wealth, temporal pleasures, and a life of ease. So to avoid the difficulties of disciplining their young lambs, they instead chose to pacify them with screens, and they were practically raised by these modern inventions and became absolutely obsessed. 
These flashy screens were a perpetual portal to instant gratification, stimulation of the senses, and dulling of the mind. Because the little lamb of our story was not allowed to have these things as early as they were, she often felt very sad and alone. However, although remaining strong with certain principles and never totally fitting in, it was quite difficult to remain set apart from the other lambs, for she spent around 50 hours a week away from home and around other lambs who didn't live or think like her. She allowed herself to be tainted by bad influences as she was weak and didn't want to be lonely. To fit in, she sometimes laughed at things that weren't funny, but rather vulgar or hurtful. To stay somewhat up to date with her peers, she watched shows and TVs and movies that her parents didn't approve of while pretending to do her homework. She learned bad words and sometimes said them, but she always felt inadequate and never fit in. She didn't like to do what she did, but she felt temporarily satisfied when she had some playmates on the playground. She grew a bit older and eventually her parents gave her a phone, but she still remained firm in not getting social media for she had seen how it corrupted and stole the innocence of her peers. The little lamb was kept busy for all of her childhood and thankfully never became addicted to screens in her younger years. She did ballet, karate, swimming, piano, and singing lessons. And at 12 years of age, she joined the Air Cadets, spending seven years of her life in the program, working hard, having fun, and even earning two pilot licenses. Being a very bright and busy child, she was kept from many obvious spiritual dangers, especially preserved from engaging in immodest actions with her peers. But she was not spared from another danger, pride. She was so busy with extracurriculars and academics that she did not consider her real purpose. Rather, she was greatly concerned with her temporal and career ambitions. She wanted to be better than everyone else. She worked very hard to be the best and was sometimes bitter and disappointed if someone else was rewarded instead of her. In truth, sometimes other lambs were rewarded unjustly and the little lamb was forgotten unjustly, but these disappointments served a purpose. The little lamb came to realize that the world often rewards mediocrity and that ultimately all things are vanity, that worldly accomplishments, human respect, and material things are passing and unfulfilling, and that only God, who is infinite and eternal, can perfectly satisfy the heart. An interior transformation was beginning within her. When she was disappointed, sad, or alone, she remembered the sovereign shepherd and called out to him. She remembered that he had sacrificed himself for her so that she might someday reach the eternal green pasture. She believed in the Lamb of God and accepted him as her Lord and Savior, but she did not understand him or believe in all of his teachings. The turning point occurred when she was 16 years old. At this time, the little lamb became very curious about politics and religion. She saw how incongruous and illogical the media was when it tried to justify certain groups of hirelings and their heinous acts, and she began to look into the actual teachings and beliefs of those groups, which were terrorizing the world at the time. Simultaneously, she was told in her Catholic high school that all religions are basically the same and that they all lead to God. But she had once read the words of the Sovereign Shepherd, and she knew the truth. I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. John 14, 6. She knew that all other religions must be false because only one of them had a true good shepherd who laid down his life for their sheep, for his sheep. And there was plenty of proof that this sovereign shepherd, this Lamb of God, was real and not merely a legend. In his first letter to the Corinthians, St. Paul recorded how over 500 people had witnessed the resurrected Christ at once. Many of these witnesses went on to become martyrs for the faith. It would be completely irrational for the apostles and early Christians to have lied about the resurrection and to go on to die for a cause that they knew to be false. Therefore, one must logically conclude that the Lamb of God truly did rise from the dead as he had said he would. However, this knowledge alone was not enough to set the little lamb on the right path to lead her to the fullness of truth. 
She had always been fascinated with history, and she remembered having read about the lives of the early Christian martyrs and other saints at her elementary school library. She wondered, what could possibly have inspired and given them courage to live and die for their faith? She knew that there was something deeper that she didn't encounter in the churches where she attended mass. A certain solemnity and reverence was lacking. Rather, sacred things were treated in a casual and lackadaisical manner. The liturgy was inconsistent, loud, very flock-focused, and sentimental. It was not beautiful, brought no peace to the soul, and did not facilitate contemplation and a true relationship and conversation with God. Combined with very watered-down preaching and lack of seriousness, the little lamb knew deep down that something was wrong and that what she observed and heard at church was not pleasing to her divine shepherd, but she didn't know or understand exactly why. For several months, she became curious about Protestantism, especially the Lutheran and Baptist sects, as they appeared to be very conservative, biblically and morally sound, especially in comparison to the ecumenical messages she heard from the wolves and hirelings who had infiltrated the true flock of the church, the Catholic church. Seeing the zeal of certain Protestant pastors, as she was researching Christian apologetics online, she became aware of Catholic teachings that she hadn't been taught, but became convinced that they were ridiculous. The little lamb, despite having been raised going to Mass on Sundays, praying grace before meals and night prayers as a family, believing in Jesus and saying a Hail Mary every day, grew to believe that the Catholic Church was idolatrous, that the idea of transubstantiation was cannibalistic, and that the Blessed Virgin Mary was a sinner just like everybody else. But what really inclined her away from the true flock was the ecumenical spirit which pervaded the churches, the lack of reverence in the liturgy, the bad doctrine and bad examples of hypocritical and modernist Catholics. She became convinced that Catholicism wasn't true Christianity. One day, the little lamb had a conversation with her parents. She told them that she no longer wanted to attend Mass on Sundays because Catholicism was evil and not Christian. Her mother, listening to the little lamb's arguments, cautiously supported the idea of considering attending a new church, but her father was firm. He said, the Catholic Church is the one true church. However, he couldn't explain why, and the little lamb, as she had been taught since her youth, didn't just accept whatever she was told, she needed proof. Now, she was presented with a new challenge. She had to discern which new church to attend, the little lamb spent hours every day researching different Protestant sects, seeing that literally over 40,000 denominations exist and that some of these denominations even had their own schisms. The little lamb became so overwhelmed that she became physically ill. Something here was wrong too. She knew that only one denomination could contain the fullness of truth since two conflicting belief systems cannot both be true. She thought perhaps that she could be non-denominational and just read the Bible and that the Holy Spirit would guide her. So she began to read Holy Scripture, especially the Psalms and the New Testament. One day, she came upon a certain passage that struck her to her very core, the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 6. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood abideth in me, and I in him. Many therefore of his disciples hearing it said, this saying is hard, and who can hear it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured at this, said to them, Doth this scandalize you? The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who believe not. Therefore did I say to you that no man can come to me unless it be given him by my Father. After this, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. 
the little lamb remembered the Protestant apologists who had ridiculed this idea of transubstantiation, slandering and calumniating this dogma of the Catholic Church. But here it was, so plainly in the scriptures. It was clear that the sovereign shepherd meant it literally. His flesh is true food. His blood is true drink. If you do not eat his flesh and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Many of his followers turned away at this point, and even the 12 apostles had difficulty accepting it. Our Lord didn't try to justify or explain. He didn't recant and say, come back. I didn't mean it literally, it's just a symbol. No, he meant it literally. This was the pivotal moment in the little lamb's life. Her blindness was cured, and she became convinced at that very moment that only the Catholic Church could be the one true church. As she continued her studies, the little lamb became more and more amazed to encounter the Catholic faith in the words of Christ himself, and also in the writings of the earliest Christians, the apostles, and the church fathers. She also began to study the history of the Protestant Revolution. All of these hours of study confirmed what she already knew to be true. The Catholic faith is the one true flock of Christ. There was still one problem, however. The irreverence, lukewarmness, and superficiality at the local Catholic Mass still remained. It would seem that there was no way to worship God as he deserves. One day, the little lamb was watching YouTube videos learning about her newfound faith when she saw a recommended video that piqued her interest. It was a young lamb, just several years her senior, who was considering converting from Protestantism to Catholicism. The title of the video was Protestants Visit Latin Mass, What I Loved and Hated. As soon as she described the reverence, the silence, the incense and contemplative spirit, the heavenly Gregorian chant in sacred polyphony, the little lamb knew that this was the kind of worship that befitted the king of the universe. And she was transported back to an early childhood memory. One year, on Holy Thursday, the little lamb remembered something very special at her local parish. A priest draped in beautiful vestments, processing around the church with an ornate golden monstrance. The smell of sweet incense filled the air and instead of the typical dull hymns of the early, sun uh, early Sunday Mass or the pop rock band of the 12 p.m. Mass, she heard the choir singing a beautiful chant in a strange language. She saw several parishioners in the pews genuflecting, but she didn't understand why. At the time, the little lamb had no idea what was going on or before whom she stood, but the image stayed with her and the melody of the chant was not forgotten. She asked her parents why Mass wasn't like that all the time, but they had no answer for her. At the same time, she was attending a Catholic arts high school, and as a vocal program student, she had been exposed to Gregorian chants, and the choir was preparing to also sing Sicu Cervus by Italian Renaissance composer Palestrina for the upcoming spring concert. So when the little lamb became aware that there indeed still existed a Catholic mass that was ancient, reverent, and solemn, she knew she had to go. That very day, she told her parents, and her father was supportive right from the beginning. Her mother was a bit hesitant and not so excited. The little lamb told her parents that she and her mother needed to buy a veil and to wear modest skirts or dresses, which was different from what they were accustomed to. Several days later, on Septuagesima Sunday, the little three sheep family attended their first traditional Latin mass. The choir began to sing a sublime polyphonic setting of the Kyrie, and the little lamb could not contain her tears. She didn't understand what was going on, but she knew that she was home. Since then, the little lamb grew day by day more fascinated and in awe of the mercy of God, of the richness and beauty of the faith which he had established, and could not help herself from studying and thinking of it. Every spare moment she had was spent learning about the Catholic faith and of speaking about it with everyone she knew. She was a very zealous convert. She experienced tears and consolation in prayer often. She became a great devotee of the Blessed Virgin Mary and came to understand her great role as the mother of God and of all Christians. She learned to pray the rosary and began praying it daily. 
Her trust in the queen of the eternal pasture was so great that she enrolled in the brown scapular before she even really knew what it was. And shortly after, she consecrated herself to the Blessed Mother in holy slavery. She couldn't help herself from buying all sorts of sacramentals and spiritual books. As the little lamb became more and more involved, however, in the church community where she began attending mass regularly, her old insecurities from childhood began to resurface. The little lamb naively went into things, believing that all Latin mass attendees were just as zealous as she was, and that they were all practically saints especially those who had been going for a very long time. She desperately wanted to make close friends her age that would see things and live the way that she did, since she had never experienced that before in her life. The little lamb became a bit disillusioned as she slowly came to realize that not all the other young lambs were as serious about the faith and that some were living, in a certain sense, double lives. They would attend mass on Sundays, but then on social media would post videos of themselves acting like the rest of the world, dressing and behaving immodestly and frequenting places that were occasions of sin. Even the lambs that were not like those ones didn't have the same level of zeal, and they seemed to prefer movies and fictional stories, games and leisure, to discussions regarding the faith and practice of virtue. And when the little lamb happened to find one or two other like-minded lambs, they lived too far away to ever truly deepen and solidify their friendship. So the little lamb continued to feel alone and misunderstood. At school and in extracurriculars, she made some friendships with non-Catholics who were welcoming, funny, and saw eye to eye on some political issues. But when they made vulgar jokes and talked to her about impure or immoral actions they had partaken in, she voiced her disagreement. But then she began to give up, to remain silent, and eventually distanced herself completely. The little lamb was sad and afraid that she would always be alone and never find like-minded friends. And this sadness affected her deeply. But as long as she received spiritual consolations, she persisted and carried on. Looking back, however, the little lamb came to realize that this period of her life uh, was marked by a struggle of great scrupulosity and spiritual pride. After her disappointment with those around her, she came to consider herself, although not consciously, better than others, more serious than others, and grew impatient. Despite all the graces God had given her, she still was not happy. The sovereign shepherd knew that his little lamb had yet to learn some important lessons, and he permitted this sadness so that she could advance on the path to holiness. Her conversion was largely influenced by reason and by sentiments. He wanted to purify her so that she would be faithful, not because of what she understood or because of what she felt, but because of a deep and true love for her shepherd. About three or four years into her conversion, the little lamb along with her parents were called to move back across the sea to Portugal. It was his divine will that they should live a mere six and a half kilometers from the little town where the queen of the eternal green pasture had visited over a century earlier. The little lamb and her parents knew it was the right thing to do, and blessed by God. Even still, when they arrived to this spectacular country, they were faced with many challenges. To start, she had moved to a country where she barely spoke the language and didn't know many people. She had no idea what she was going to do her, with her life, for it had been turned upside down by circumstance. The little lamb thought that the snowy Canadian winters were harsh, but boy was she in for a rude awakening. No amount of wool was enough to keep her warm in the damp Portuguese winter nights. Her family had no home of their own. They were living with extended family who criticized them for attending the traditional Latin mass and for trying to live their faith. The church she began attending was much smaller than the one she had previously attended, and there were very few young sheep around her age at the time. For a year and a half, the little lamb was oppressed with sadness. Despite living in such a wonderful country, with so much history and so many stunning landscapes, going and visiting so many beautiful monuments of our faith. Despite living so close to where Our Lady of Fatima had appeared with Holy Mass just down the street, she, despite having joined cha the chapel choir and finding work as an English teacher and beginning to learn and design, uh, to learn how to design and sew clothes, she still felt very alone and began to feel as though the sovereign shepherd was deaf to her prayers, even though she knew he wasn't. Over time, she decreased her prayer devotions, sometimes skipping her morning prayers or her evening prayers or cutting them in half. 
She stopped doing so much spiritual reading and began to cool off in her zeal. Her motivation plummeted, and rather than struggling with scrupulosity as she had before, she began to struggle with spiritual sloth and lukewarmness. She became less and less inclined to take responsibility for her actions. It was though all she had previously understood and felt were distant memory. How could this be, when she had been so fervent just a year or two ago? It happened so slowly and subtly. The problem was not her circumstances, it was her mindset. She was still too set on her own desires, her own will, her own timing. The Sovereign Shepherd permitted all of this to show her how truly poor and incapable of good she was without him, and how unfaithful she could be when things didn't go her way. He wanted to teach her patience and trust in him. He wanted her to love him, not for what he did for her or for how he made her feel, but purely for his own sake. Over time, the little lamb came to realize that knowledge or understanding of the faith and spiritual consolations aren't proof of holiness. That to have a healthy Catholic life, it is necessary to have balance. One must be zealous and constant, but one cannot be scrupulous or lax. And most importantly, that true happiness consists in accepting and in doing God's will, even when it is difficult to see the light at the end of the tunnel or to understand why we are here or what God is calling us to do. What kept her going during this period of darkness and dryness was her consecration to Our Lady. Every day, she made a point to pray this prayer. O Mary, my queen and my mother, I give myself entirely to thee. To show my devotion to thee, I consecrate to thee this day my eyes, my ears, my mouth, my heart, my whole being without reserve. Wherefore, good mother, I am thine. Keep me and guard me as thy property and possession. And having prayed this, trusting in Our Lady, she patiently waited for God's response. Now, the Sovereign Shepherd always answers our prayers, but, as, but often at times and in ways that we don't expect. It was after a year and a half of sadness, bitterness, and disappointment that the little lamb finally stopped worrying and resigned herself entirely to the will of God. Almost immediately, things began to change. She felt an inner peace that she had not felt in a very long time. Instead of being negative, she began to radiate joy. Soon the little lamb found herself returning to fervor, but this time it was steadier, constant, and not so emotional and self-focused as it had been before. The chapel had already been growing into a vibrant and flourishing community, but now she had the right mindset to meet other young lambs and began forming friendships. She began to complain and blame less, even though some of her circumstances remained the same. And she began to look at her challenges as instruments for her sanctification, rather than as insufferable burdens. Within a few months of this new attitude, the Sovereign Shepherd placed in, the Sovereign, uh, sorry, Within a few months of this new attitude, and around, she became more involved in faith activities, and the Sovereign Shepherd began to place other opportunities before her to make him known and loved in the world. World Youth Day 2023 was held for all of the young lambs of the flock right in Portugal where the little lamb lives. Joining with a small group of faithful sheep from the Fatima Center, they spent several days working to bring the message of our Lord to the lost sheep, and especially to encourage devotion to His Holy Mother. They would do this using the talents God had given them, especially through music, sharing the beauty of sacred music and performing in the beautiful monuments, and through speaking with and listening to the stories of those that they met, planting seeds so that they might come to understand how we can achieve true peace in the world. She began to meet many sheep, even after World Youth Day, and to share with them the message of Fatima. It pleased the Sovereign Shepherd that this little lamb might be an instrument to help others deepen their faith while simultaneously deepening her own, and she continues to grow in devotion to the Queen of the Eternal Pasture and strives to obey her message every day. Around this same time, the Sovereign Shepherd placed in her life one who was surprisingly complimentary, who had some similar experiences, the same values and goals in life, and even some of the same tastes, but who was different enough to bring out the best in her and she in him. 
After about three months of talking once in a while and spending time together in group settings, they began courting. Both soon came to realize that they wanted to spend the rest of their lives together, helping each other to grow in virtue and love of the Sovereign Shepherd, and to arrive at the eternal green pasture. After a little less than a year of courtship, they got engaged, and this is where the little lamb is at now. Her story, just like that of all the Sovereign Shepherd's sheep, will continue to unfold, and hopefully what she has learned will be of benefit to her soul and to you who hear her story so that we may all one day come to the happy hills of the eternal green pasture. So, why have I been sharing the story of the little lamb, which is really my story? I'm hoping that my experience thus far will inspire you to consider your own life and the special graces and talents that God has also given you, so that you may come to understand how God wants you to spread his beauty, truth, and goodness in the world. On this journey of life, we must be prepared for both periods of consolation and of desolation. Regardless of what we feel or understand, even in moments of dryness, God never abandons us. Life is a work in progress, a constant process of conversion. Holiness is not attained in one aha moment, but in daily faithfulness to God's will. We must remember to keep our eyes on eternity and not on the things of earth. God made us for himself and gives us all the graces we need to remain faithful to him. We live in this world, but we were not made for the world. So why did I choose the allegory of sheep and shepherds to share my conversion story? Throughout the Old Testament, God was often called the shepherd of his people. And it pleased our Lord himself during his earthly life to assume the title of Good Shepherd and to use the shepherd and sheep relationship to demonstrate his ineffable love and care for us. However, our Lord is not only the Good Shepherd, but also the Lamb of God, fully God and fully man, fully shepherd and fully lamb. Jesus, being fully man, was able to provide the material for the sacrifice, namely his body and his blood. This is why he is the true lamb of God. Being also fully God, Jesus by divine right is also our good shepherd. As the shepherd is master and protector of his sheep, so God is our master and protector, who sustains us, keeps us safe from all danger, and leads us to our eternal pasture, which is heaven. We can partake in this glory of heaven insofar as we conform ourselves to Christ. In essence, to be of the world is to seek our own will, whereas to be of God is to conform our will to his. So let us first consider Jesus, the Lamb of God, whom we must imitate. St. John the Baptist, publicly introducing Christ as the Messiah for the first time, said, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who taketh away the sins of the world, confirming the prophecies that the Messiah would save his people from sin. Jesus is the Lamb of God because he is the perfect fulfillment of the old law. The bloody Passover sacrifices of spotless little lambs on the altar of the temple were merely a foreshadowing of the one holy sacrifice of the body and blood of the true Lamb of God on the altar of the cross. In becoming man, God elevated our dignity and made it possible for man to participate in his divine life in a more perfect and intimate way than ever before. We now can live as God himself lived on earth. Even death has been sanctified because God died for us. Christ's death, the perfect atonement for all sins, has made death the path to life to the extent that we conform our life and death to his. The great prophet Isaiah foretold how our Lord would be the ultimate sacrificial lamb, the propitiation for all the sins of the world. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Every one hath turned aside into his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. In one sense, this shows how sheep, despite their innate flocking characteristics, also often get so separated from the flock. We are like those sheep. We were created to be in God's flock, on earth and then in heaven. But because of our disordered inclinations, while on the treacherous journey towards the eternal pasture of heaven, we are in constant danger of separating ourselves from the flock of Christ. 
We know, however, that lambs can also be the gentlest and most submissive of creatures. The true Lamb of God, our Lord, is the humble, obedient sheep who, trusting his Father, remains silent and conformed to God's will as he offered his life for ours. When we trust in our Father in heaven completely, we too become like this spotless lamb, magnifying his image in our souls and in the world. Now, let us consider Jesus, the Good Shepherd, whom we must trust. It, remember the parable of the lost sheep? The Good Shepherd left 99 sheep in the mountains to go and rescue only one sheep. So, so now, the shepherd could leave the 99 in the mountains because at this point they are free from danger. At the summit of the mountain, there is often open space, good pasture land, and clean water. This is an image of heaven, and the 99 sheep are the saints. The one sheep that was lost is a poor soul who is in danger because for some reason it got separated from the flock, the Catholic Church, on the treacherous path to the mountain, which is this world with all of its temptations. Like ravening wolves, the world, the flesh, and the devil are all around us, seeking to confuse and devour us. As the isolated sheep, we are also very vulnerable and susceptible to danger if we are not with Christ, our shepherd. But this is the extent of the love of Christ for each one of us. He descends to our misery to save us from danger and rejoices when we turn back to him. He went so far to prove this with the sacrifice of his own life. This is why we cannot simply live as we please or believe what we like. We owe to our good shepherd the devotion of perfect, obedient sheep. Now what can sheep teach us about living in this world? Know ye that the Lord, he is God. He made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Psalm 99 verse 3. Throughout history, across all cultures and generations, sheep have been noted for their docility, their absolute dependence on and trust in their shepherd. Sheep are cute, fluffy, harmless animals with no sharp teeth or claws and very little strength or speed. Sheep can do nothing to protect themselves and fend off their predators. Sometimes a more daring you will try and headbutt a predator, although it isn't often a very effective defense. Their main protection is flocking, following each other and their shepherd. Sheep are safest when they are in a flock, but if a sheep gets separated from the flock, it becomes very easy prey and susceptible to danger. According to Kathy McCune of Family Farm Livestock, sheep group together and count on the confusion of the flock as their main defense. Sheep also tend to run first and think later, which will hopefully get them out of the range of a predator. So what can we learn from these sheep? Firstly, it is never wise to dialogue with the enemy. Just as the ewe's headbutt is largely ineffective and she often gets hurt instead of him, trying to reason with the devil, our flesh, or the world is not a good strategy. Rather, we should, like most sheep, run from danger first and think later. Our greatest danger is temptation to sin. So whenever we feel tempted, we must flee. However, where should we go? To our good shepherd. Why does the flock serve as a source of confusion for predators? Because with so many sheep grouped together, it's difficult to tell them apart. And it's also difficult to isolate or attack one without the others noticing. One thing I've observed over the past three years living in Portugal is how sheep interact with each other. One of my neighbors keeps a flock of sheep. I have seen how each of them, contrary to popular belief, is actually quite distinct and not merely a mindless creature. Each sheep has its own personality and quirks. Some are natural leaders, others are timid, others are rambunctious and daring. Some are very silly and naive and get themselves into all sorts of trouble. Some are stubborn, while others are gentler and easier to tame. It's very entertaining to watch and listen to them interact. One can see how they are quite sociable and have their own social hierarchy. The weaker ones look up to the stronger ones. And this is the power of the flock. Despite their individual differences, they grow and adapt to imitate and follow each other and ultimately their shepherd. We are called to do likewise. This is what it means to be a sheep. 
to follow the Lamb of God and our Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ, all the days of our lives. And since we are the littlest and weakest lambs in his flock, to look up to and also follow the examples of the greatest and wisest sheep of the flock, namely the Blessed Virgin Mary, the saints, and the angels, so that like them, we eventually become indistinguishable from him and are kept safe in the flock. And this magnifying of Christ and his creatures greatly confuses and puts Satan and all the forces of hell to shame, just as a united flock of sheep confuses and keeps its predators at bay. Insofar as we stay together, united as a flock, and conform ourselves to our good shepherd, we are safe from the attacks of our enemies. As we come to the close of this talk, I would like to contemplate Psalm 22. Saint David, first a humble shepherd, then king of Israel, illustrates perfectly the attitude that sheep of Christ should have while living in the world, and shows us how we should act in our relation to our good shepherd. The Lord ruleth me, and I shall want nothing. He has set me in a place of pasture. He hath brought me up on the water of refreshment. He hath converted my soul. He hath led me on the paths of justice for his own name's sake. For though I should walk in the midst of the shadow of death, I will fear no evils, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they have comforted me. Thou hast prepared a table before me against them that afflict me. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, and my chalice which inebriateth me. How goodly it is! And thy mercy will follow me all the days of my life, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord unto length of days. God is our shepherd. He feeds us, guides us, and governs us. Like sheep, we must not be solicitous for anything. Rather, we must completely trust that our Good Shepherd will provide for all of our needs, both material and spiritual. We know this because God has always given us all that we need, and even more. He has created us after his own image and likeness, redeemed us by his precious blood, brought us to the light of faith, and continues to sustain us despite our unfaithfulness and lack of trust. This world is not our home, but rather we walk on a path of sorrow, the shadow of death and the valley of tears. But we can walk the path of justice, which is to imitate and follow our good shepherd. This is of course for God's own name's sake, for his glory and also for ours, so that we may reach the eternal pasture of heaven and partake in his glory. We must remember that although we are surrounded by threats and even by those who hate and want our destruction, God, our shepherd, is with us. As St. Paul says, If God be for us, who is against us? With his rod, he fends off the predators of our souls. With his staff, he gently corrects or chastises us so that we may remain on the right path. He is a generous and kind shepherd and gives us graces in abundance. He anoints our head with oil as oil prevents insects from pestering, entering into the eyes and ears and mouths of sheep, laying their eggs and destroying the sheep, our Lord's grace prevents the devil from causing us harm. As oil helps to heal any wounds that the sheep have, our Lord's grace also helps to heal the wounds of sin in our souls, should we have the misfortune to fall. If we follow him, he will lead us to his heavenly home, which he also prepared for us. This is why we are here, why God gave us life. We live in the world, but we are not called to be of the world. We are called to be like God, to love what God loves and to hate what God hates, to practice virtue and to abhor sin. God doesn't ask much of us. All he has ever wanted from us is our love and our trust, demonstrated by our faithfulness to whatever he asks of us, because he is our good, and loving Father. Let us wrap up with a glory be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. Thank you, may God bless you, and may our Lady Fatima protect you.